Welcome to this UKLFI Charitable Trust webinar on the Assassin Report, a groundbreaking analysis of BBC coverage of the Israel Hamas war holding the corporation to account against its own standards of accuracy and balance. This report is the product of a team of lawyers working together with data scientists. They have used AI to assess the output of the BBC across television, radio, web and podcasts in the months following the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October last year. The analysis has examined 9 million words produced by the BBC in both its English language and Arabic services, and the findings reveal a deeply worrying pattern of bias and multiple breaches by the BBC of its own guidelines on impartiality, fairness, and establishing the truth. The report runs to 199 pages, and there are a further 190 pages of schedules and further appendices. Now, veteran BBC editor Jeremy Bowen was quick to dismiss it, describing it as a deeply flawed document. Perhaps that speaks volumes. The team behind the report has been led by Trevor Asserson, and I'm delighted to introduce Trevor to discuss the analysis and conclusions, as well as to explore what is being done and what can be done to ensure that the BBC complies with its legal obligations. He is a leading UK litigation solicitor who in 2005 set up Asserson Law Offices, a UK law firm based in Tel Aviv, which is now the largest international law firm in Israel. Earlier in his career, Trevor acted for two political parties in a claim of bias against the BBC, and that prompted him to found BBC Watch, a platform scrutinising the BBC's Middle East coverage, which published a number of independent reports exposing BBC bias in the Middle East. I cannot think of many with greater experience on monitoring the BBC's bias. Trevor, welcome. Thank you, Natasha. It's difficult to know exactly where to begin, but having studied history uh, for my degree, I always think that telling the story is really helpful. So Natasha explained that when I was a junior lawyer with um, uh, Herbert Smith, I was instructed, I was one of a group of, of people instructed to sue the BBC um, for two political parties. And that's what taught me what the, the way in which you can bring a judicial review against the BBC, which is, I think, the only really safe way of suing them. Um, and then in the Second Intifada, um, there was a very wide concern uh, about the way in which the BBC was handling the Middle East story. Uh, so I brushed off the, the work that I'd done as a young lawyer and um, started to produce reports analysing the BBC coverage in the way in which could have been used as evidence to support a claim. And, and because of that, when this war started, I was approached by a client um, as someone with experience about dealing with the BBC and asked to look into the Al-Akhli Hospital uh, debacle, where the um, uh, probably 50 to 100 people were killed in the car park of a hospital by Islamic Jihad, but Israel was alleged by the BBC and other journalists to have dropped a bomb on the hospital itself and killed 500 people, which proved to be untrue. A story the BBC has never actually properly retracted. And looking into that, what emerged was that the only way in which one can properly bring a, um, a claim against the BBC for breach of its obligations is by recording what the BBC output was for a sufficiently long time that no, they can't argue that it isn't representative, and then analysing that. And if indeed there is an evidence of bias, um, that, would, that would be the evidence that one could bring to complain. If it emerged that there wasn't uh, evidence of bias, then of course um, the feelings that members of the Jewish community and others have that the BBC is failing to uh, comply with its obligations could have turned out to be wrong. Um, so that was the way I started the study. And I didn't realise quite how big it would get. But partway through, after I'd been going for a few weeks, 
of uh, recording BBC coverage and putting together a team of lawyers to analyze it. I got approached by some Israeli data scientists. And this is where actually the project grew in both scope and shape, because this group of data scientists had been looking around for a way of um, uh, getting legal guidance for an experiment experiments they were putting together. And what ended up was one particular scientist, Haran Shani Narkis, an Israeli working in the in the UK. Um, he really led the group and he put together a group which included professors at Hebrew U and bar Ilan and, and many other quite significant um, experts in the field. Ended up with a group of 20 and even more people than that. And what they did was under a, a certain amount of legal guidance from myself as to what experiments would or wouldn't be useful, they devised experiments um, and then uh, conducted those experiments and produced the results uh, in what was effectively a completely separate initiative to the legal initiative, which was the classic legal initiative of looking at the material, getting lawyers to read it and assess it. And the way I describe the, the resulting report is that it was something like a, um, if you think of the report as being made of concrete, which is quite a solid material, uh, using traditional building materials. And if you remember the, the forum in Rome um, that uh, is partly built of concrete, uh, you know, it's quite an ancient building material. So these techniques are well tested and well tried. What the AI does, what the, what the uh, data scientists did, was they put metal rods inside the concrete. That is to say, we've produced reinforced concrete. So the report that we've got is the results of two complementary groups of people using complementary skills, but different skills, both looking at the same material, because we used exactly the same data set, and ending up with very similar results, uh, but by different routes. And uh, I, I go into that level of detail to explain that when the BBC, the first thing they did was they looked at it and said, oh, we've got questions about the methodology. Actually, all they it, it, it was a bit like saying, oh, you know, we, we're not sure about this report because it's been typed on something called a typewriter. Um, it, it's it's a ridiculous complaint, um, and and we've never actually yet had what the questions about that methodology are. They haven't been expressed to us. Doubtless they will be in due course, but really they they did that simply because I think it was a knee jerk reaction. It uses AI. AI is newfangled, so let's question the methodology. But actually, you've got some very very serious high quality scientists doing their work in, in their style. And you have uh, a series of lawyers who I, I hope are also uh, decent quality doing work in the style that, that we've all, always done. So that's how the report came to be written. But it's how it also came to be a much larger piece of work than I had anticipated. What we, what we did was we, we decided that we, we would record all of the main, the principal news outputs uh, out, output for um, various uh, for, for radio, television, um, web the website, and also in Arabic, and we would transcribe all the oral uh, work so that we could read it all, and also that, so that we could search all of the material. And the Arabic was translated through very various electronic translation systems, and then um, transcribed into into English, so that we could search what at the end of four months, which is when I turned the recording off, was um, approximately nine million words of material, plus thousands of pictures and videos. So we had a very very big job analysing it. But in my view, a third of a year is a representative sample. And so that's the, that's the history of, of what we did. And then I'll just take you through some of the principal findings. And it's, it's worth saying that at the outset, we really didn't know whether we would find the bias that 
so many people felt existed. But don't forget, there are many um, pro-Palestinians who think that the BBC is pro-Israel. So um, our instincts may have been wrong. Uh, and, and it was worth, you know, until we were six or seven months into the exercise, we couldn't really know what findings we, we would uh, come up with. But the findings really, I would put into two or three categories. The first is the, the general finding across English news was that there was not only bias, but the, the bias, not I, the, the lack of um, impartiality was far greater than we expected. And it was consistent. Uh, on every vector we looked at almost, uh, there was an anti-negative to Israel, um, impart, lack, of, lack of impartiality. The other finding, principal finding, is that the Arabic, BBC Arabic, was far, far uh, more biased and uh, um, far more thoroughly failed the test of impartiality than um, anything else, uh, than the English. So if I can now, just as an aside, just talk about what, what is a breach? And that's a very complex question because ultimately there the BBC, and this is why the BBC is very difficult to hold to account, the BBC says, well, we have an independent editorial right to decide how to tell a story. So that's, that's actually partially untrue, as I'm going to explain. But what the BBC would therefore say is, if, if let's say we detected, as we did in the website, that there was about 60% of the stories were negative to Israel and 40% were negative to um, Palestinians, they would say, well, 60-40 is, we think, a very fair and reasonable uh, balance. And it's not really possible for us to, for, for us, meaning an outsider, to argue with the BBC, which has discretion as to how to tell a story. So we had to find vectors which would be able to look more precisely than that. And what we did, therefore, was say, fine, let's assume that your 60, 40 or whatever number we come up with is the right number. That's what you editorially think is balanced. How do you explain that the Arabic is 90-10 or 95-5, which is the sort of split that we found in the Arabic? And immediately you ask that question, you, you, you've got the BBC in the difficult position that they're, they're trying to argue that uh, the split that they reached uh, after much consideration as being appropriate of 60-40 in one language is changed to 95-5 in another language. That can't be right. So one of those numbers is, is, is wrong. And then, whilst we accept that the um, there is editorial uh, license to select where they place the balance of a particular story, and there's no question there's more death and destruction going on in Gaza after the first tragic day of the 7th of October than, than there has been in Israel, even though there's been a lot of death and destruction in Israel as well. Um, but then if you like, take, say, Newsnight, Newsnight was about 50% neutral. Of the other 60%, that is to say, um, you, you take away the bits that are neutral, which are basically balanced. Um, it's fine for them to have some other stories which are pro-Palestinian and some which are pro-Israeli. But where the balance of that is 100% pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel and 0% pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian, then... I think we can safely say to the BBC that wherever they consider balance to be, 100 nil is not balance. So you've got various arguments on where balance should lie in order to achieve impartiality. 
but it, it's you, you, I don't think we can say it's 50-50. What we can say is the BBC should be consistent across its programming, and it totally fails to be so. Let me now go on to another major area in the report, because in order to achieve impartiality, the BBC has set out about uh, 130 pages of guidelines for its own journalists, but those guidelines are publicly available in, in on the website. And if you look at those guidelines, they set out certain rules which they which need to be obeyed in order to achieve impartiality. And one of those is that no significant storyline will be underreported or omitted. Now that makes complete sense uh, because if you omit an important storyline then what you're doing is you're only telling one side of the story so we what we did was we looked for storylines that we suspected might not be found to check whether or not they in fact have been covered and if if we're right that these are important stories or important elements of the story then a failure to cover those is a further indication of bias, along with the balance of, as I said, 95 5. Uh, you know, there's a challenge as to whether that can possibly be the right balance. And certainly um, there has to be consistency across uh, everything. But that's one argument. Now we're on to the omissions argument. And the kinds of stories which we looked at were, um, for example, Hamas is motivated by a charter. And the Charter calls for the destruction of Israel as a state, the killing of Jews, and specifically states that negotiations are not uh, allowed. So clearly, if Hamas is operating based on these ideologies, which it does appear to be so, be the case and and these you know these charters have been around they've been revised but they these elements exist um and have existed for years then we think that it is a pretty important part of the story for the audience to understand what is motivating these people to do what they are doing and why israel feels that it cannot leave gaza in the hands of a genocidal literally you know this is this is their aim is to is to commit genocide of all jews and to destroy the state of israel they are not suitable rulers for a neighbor particularly when they actually do what they say which is what they did on the 7th of october they started a genocide um, committing all sorts of atrocities and trying to bring about the destruction of the state of israel um now, the fact that there is um, such a charter was barely mentioned by the BBC at all. It was mentioned about, I forget the number, nine or 12 times by in passing by people that were being interviewed, but essentially never mentioned by the BBC in its own editorial, in its own journalists explaining this fact to the audience. So the audience are left utterly ignorant of, of this fact. Another fact which it seemed to us is an important element in the story is that about 200,000 Israelis have lost their homes and been forced to flee because they are being targeted by missiles from the north and the south. And that includes large swathes of Israeli territory which are effectively uninhabitable by um, civilians, and where civilians have been uh, and are being killed. Now, uh, astonishingly, in four months, which is a third of a year, um, the BBC only had one article on that topic, and that one article was told in a way that was negative towards Israel, which was extraordinary. I've asked audiences in many um, different places, if anybody can think of a way in which you could tell that particular story in a way that's negative about Israel. 
Um, I'll leave you thinking about that. And um, if someone asks the question later, when we get to questions and answers, I'll give you an answer. Uh, so essentially, that story was not told. The story of the disruption caused to Israeli society by the war, uh, massive financial strain, destruction of businesses, um, 400,000, um, three to 400,000 Milowimnikim people being called up for reserve duty who are um, very, very largely uh, men, uh, married men with jobs uh, and with wives and children, um, all of whom have rendered their wives effectively single parents for the duration of their, their, their service, are having their wives and children living in and, and, and parents living under the terrible strain of knowing that they're literally facing uh, the danger of being killed or maimed. Uh, many hundreds have been killed and, and um, I think into the thousands have been maimed. People who've lost an arm or a leg or an eye, um, you know, my my children who are uh, of an age of of Milowimnikim are are of people running doing service all now have friends who have lost a limb and will know people as we know uh, people who have been killed uh, and the disruption imagine you're running a business and all of your staff below the age of 40 have been called up um that's massively disruptive to businesses, small businesses. It could be 100% of the staff have gone, which means it kills the business. Um, these are all huge disruptions, huge distresses, huge um, difficulties, which Israel is facing in a war in which it has zero territorial aims. These are wars not of its choosing, which are entirely brought about really by the aggressive genocidal uh, views of the Iranian state, um, Hezbollah and, and Hamas. And these stories aren't told at all by the BBC. They are barely touched upon in four months. We couldn't find, we searched all of the material um, and were unable to find any uh, analysis of this uh, at all. So these are missions simply by failing to tell the story, are a further example of where the BBC is breaching its own guidelines, and those guidelines are designed to enable it to achieve um, an impartial account. So they're failing. And I'll, I'll give one third example of a sort of set of rules which uh, they break. Uh, and then I'll uh, probably stop and, and, and leave it open to uh, questions because there, there's plenty more to talk about remedies and and why it's happening and 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 and, and so on. Which uh, I did dare say people will ask me those questions and I'll reserve that. But the third area that we looked at is um, what other rules are they are they breaking? And I'll, I'll just mention two. One is that they should always tell the audience if they're reporting from an area where there are reporting restrictions. Now, that means that if they're reporting something like the number of people that have died from sources within the um, Gaza, where we know that Hamas strictly controls every word that is expressed by journalists, and they do that in, with, with a certain degree of force and cruelty, uh, where people say things that they shouldn't. That needs to be said every single time that they report from somebody in Gaza. If that person from Gaza has some affiliation with Hamas or has posted um, on social media saying whoopee when October the 7th happened, that also needs to be explained to the audience so that when the audience sees this account from someone who appears to be a doctor or a professor or some very apparently respectable individual, they need to be told that these are people that that let out blood-curdling whoops of, 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 of joy 
when they hear of the brutal uh, rape and murder and death and destruction of Jews on the 7th of October. These are people that love that. And once you know that, then it does change your perception. There's also a question as to whether or not they should be giving a platform to people who support terrorism at all. But that's another question. And then the, my final point, really, uh, and then I'll hand it over back to Natasha for, for questions, is expressing a personal view. It's an absolutely forbidden rule um, that it's, it's a very clear rule that, the, that journalists should not express their own personal opinions. So we looked at one particular journalist, um, Jeremy Bowen. We chose him because um, the perception that we have is that he has got a pretty negative attitude towards Israel. Uh, we wanted to test that. And so we looked not only actually at what he says on stage, but what he says off stage. In other words, in his book, to which he will occasionally um, uh, recommend his audience, the, the, the Making of the Mid Modern Middle East. So we did a deep analysis of, of, of what he says in that book, in which he expresses very, very clear opinions in a very biased way. And then looked at what he has recorded on his own podcasts and what he's recorded elsewhere. So we looked at all of his output in that four month period and showed how time and time and time again, amongst other things, he breaks this rule and expresses a very clear personal opinion. Uh, and that is exactly what he should not be doing uh, as a BBC journalist uh, in order to enable the BBC to achieve impartiality, which they are, of course, failing to achieve. So that's a very brief, probably not brief enough, summary of what the content of the findings are. And uh, I'll stop here, draw breath and, and see if there are any questions. Well, Trevor, thank you very much indeed. I know we'll also be circulating the report uh, to everyone who's registered for the webinar uh, so that they can uh, go through the detail of what you've described. Um, no doubt, well, there is little doubt perhaps then as to uh, Jeremy Bowen's motivation for calling this document deeply flawed in light of the, the last point that you raised. Um, but on the individuals themselves, I, I wondered if I might be able to just drill down on the last issue that you were raising on affiliations or sympathies, um, because there is a very recent story, uh, which I've seen in the Jewish Chronicle with respect to Saeed Muhammad Marandi, who is this uh, supposed academic professor from um, uh, an Iranian university who has been commenting frequently now on the uh, BBC uh, without any reference to his boasting about the time that he spent in the IRGC, um, prescribed terrorist organization by 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 some states. Um, what do you make of the manner in which commentators have been brought in, in addition to the coverage? Or is this something that you've considered with respect to the report? What, what we did, um, and this perhaps might show a, a natural suspicion or bias by us, we decided to look at the Arabic speakers um, who were either commentators or journalists, uh, and that included Miranda, uh, Professor Miranda, who's, I think, an English literature professor in, in Iran. Um, and we, we, we managed to get some Arab speakers, Arabic speakers, to look at about 150 or 200 names out of about 450 names that we identified as Arabic speakers. They were Arabic speakers who were interviewed either in Arabic or in English, but Arabic was their native tongue. And the reason we chose them was we we assumed that they would be um, subject to less scrutiny by English speakers than, say, people who are certain, uh, posting in English. And so that they would be able to get away with um, presenting uh, more outrageous people uh, that, than they could perhaps uh, in, in English. And we got people, Arab, Arabic speakers, to look at their social media posts, to look at other public things they published, and to try and identify people. We identified close to 30% of that particular group, of the ones we were able to look at, as having expressed great joy on um, 
on the 7th of October and also on another date in in um, a, about a year earlier when there was an atrocious attack and terrorists killed many Israelis, a few Israelis. Again, that was a date on which all these people expressed very clear um, joy at what had happened. And the, these these kinds of postings ought to disqualify them, or at the very least, the BBC has an obligation to say who they are and fails to do so. Trevor, there's an avalanche of questions in the Q&A facility, but just before we move on to them, that there is one other matter I want to drill down on, and it is to do with the motivation or the explanation behind all of this. You mentioned the al Ahli hospital incident. Um, yeah. I believe this was very early on, on the, on the 17th of October. Um, I have a personal story connected to that because I was actually waiting on the line to be interviewed by the BBC yeah. um, as this story was breaking. And I received a call from the deputy editor of the channel who said that they were going to have to bump me to run with this rolling coverage. And I used the opportunity to challenge what it was that I was seeing in real time. So there's the complaints process, and you've spoken in the past about the difficulties uh, with that, and certainly the BBC's line that it should have discretion on how to tell a story. There's nuance attached to that. And um, so far as I see what played out on that occasion, there was no nuance. Um, what was being reported was... Uh, ultimately false. But even in the context of the fog of war, the conclusions that were being jumped to were inexplicable, where there were already reports online that this could have been a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket, which is what ultimately turned out to be the case. When uh, the rate of rockets from Hamas and PIJ that fall short in the Gaza Strip is so significant, and when we consider that the hospital itself was intact, you've spoken about reporting from Gaza, and it's clear that the BBC has relied on stringers uh, from the Gaza Strip uh, for the last 12 months. Why on earth couldn't they have sent someone down to walk down the street and check what the situation at the hospital was? They would have seen that it was intact. Um, on the basis of everything that you've looked at, is there any explanation that you can um, offer for the uh, abject failure of responsible journalism on that occasion and all the others that you've highlighted? Um, you, you, the last bit of your question goes to motive, but let me uh, raise something else. The BBC guidelines specifically state where there is a very important story uh, and where there is um, a a story which is controversial. These are two words which get defined in the guidelines. And the killing of 500 people in a hospital um, as, the, is, as, the, as the US president is, is flying into Israel in order to try and um, start patching things up is pretty controversial and pretty important. It certainly fulfills those requirements. Under those circumstances, the, the guidelines specifically say slow down and double check your story, even if that means you don't get your story out quite as quickly as other people who are less professional journalists than you. What the BBC does, and this is clearly motivated partly at least by a, a, a desire, I think, to keep the ratings, and there may be malevolence in the, in the eyes of uh, certain, certain journalists who who wants to find bad stories about Israel, is they do the very opposite of their own guidelines. Instead of realizing this is a big story, they've got to slow down where they don't have good evidence, make sure they've got a, a stringer that they can rely on, pop down the road, as you said, and look at the hospital. It's a huge building. In fact, it's a series of buildings. It, uh, it would not take long to check that this building has not been flattened if it hasn't been flattened then 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 the, the story is clearly wrong or, um, or even to see that uh in fact the missile had hit the car park yes and the the, the missile hit the car park and, and everything about the story was upside down and wrong and not to do that is such a clear breach of their own regulations and their own guidelines and that is the crime here the fact that they got a story wrong in fact, is not, to my mind, 
the the worst of it. The worst of it is that they got the story wrong by breaking their own rules in the most flagrant way. And there's a further point which I think is worth mentioning. As part of their cover for their stories, the BBC has created a page called BBC Verify. Mm -hmm. And if you actually read the account of their analysis of this particular story, it is so full of holes. Um, but it, it, it makes me feel that they ought to rename it BBC Pravda because it, it is just a system for covering up the truth and not for un, un, um, demonstrating the truth. They say they asked a number of experts about the explosion. They give the results of two or three of those experts who make it pretty clear it couldn't have been an Israeli missile. And they don't give the results of the other experts they asked. We presumably said it was without doubt not an Israeli missile. Everyone else in the world has accepted that, that, that it was a, a Palestinian missile. The BBC's BBC Verify, when I last looked, which was months after the event, and then they, I don't know if they've changed it since, said, oh, in the fog of war, it's all too difficult to tell. It'll be one of the mysteries that never gets uh, resolved. And that's a, an, a really, um, it, it, it's just so incredible uh, that that can be viewed as a serious response to, to an investigation into a clear error. Uh, that, it, as I said, it, it, it undermines the validity of BBC Verify as an organisation, as a part of the BBC. Mm. Um, Trevor, there are a few questions here that have been advanced about the Balin report. Um, perhaps you could explain to our audience, I have to say, record numbers uh, who've uh, joined us for this webinar. Um, perhaps you could explain what the Balin report in 2004 was and, and yeah. to what extent it's impacted your approach and research here. Yeah. Well, the Balin report was a report when, when the BBC came under pressure from a variety of sources, including myself, back in the Second Intifada. And I, I, I claim including myself because when I met Michael Balin at the time, he told me that my reports then had been one of the reasons why he had been appointed. What the BBC did was they went and got an independent individual who had worked for his entire career at the BBC, um, uh, uh, but had then left the BBC. And they brought him back and said, will you please do an entirely independent report into um, our BBC Middle East coverage? When that report was finished, even though it was conducted by, as I said, a, a BBC person, um, paid for and hired by the BBC editorial staff, it it found that the BBC was negative to Israel. And because of that finding, it got hidden away and never published. And a Jewish lawyer who subsequently died of cancer, I think, spent um, hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, and the last years of his life fighting up to the Supreme Court and back to get to see that report. But the BBC successfully resisted it because although they are subject to the Freedom of Information Act, they have managed to negotiate an exclusion where they don't have to give any information if the information relates to the subject of journalism. Um, that is sort of like saying that, you know, the, the train service is, is, is not obliged to give any information if it relates to trains. Uh, what, what else would you want them to give information about? So it's effectively... They have managed to negotiate an opt-out of freedom of information. They took that all the way to the Supreme Court, spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of uh, license fee money to defend their position. And that, therefore, that report has never seen the light of day. I know what it says because a very senior BBC individual was able to get access to it. And subsequently, he told me that it's negative of Israel. It's 20 years out of date, but th that, that's what the Balin report is. To my mind, it's now a piece of uh, uh, shameful BBC history. Uh, it's not relevant, that relevant to today, other than to show that things haven't changed, they've got worse. And to indicate that this phenomenon is is nothing new, um, and perhaps yeah. we can come back to that when we when we talk about what can be done about it. Um, but there's one question here which uh, strikes me as as particularly pertinent to this consideration of balance 
because you've spoken about that. The BBC journalists, when interviewed about their approach to these matters, highlight balance. But the balance seems to be one that is struck between an internationally prescribed terrorist organization on the one hand and the only democracy in the Middle East, a law abiding army, a democratic state on the other. And those are the issues that are being balanced as opposed to, um, uh, you know, accuracy uh, or or providing, um, as you have indicated, a flavor of the motivations behind uh, those with affiliations to Hamas uh, and yeah. uh, an assessment of, of how they can be taken uh, by the viewers. How do you see balance factoring into the BBC's approach to the sort of both sides analysis of the conflict? Well, I think that balance as such is, is unfortunately not clearly defined within the guidelines. Uh, they, they seek to achieve balance, but impartiality and balance are somewhat intertwined and confused rules. The more that you pick away at the rules, the the less light that you you that they they throw on how you should actually behave, except for as I said, certain negative rules such as do not give your personal opinion. What 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 I can tell you, balance is not is um, that that they have to be fifty fifty on every story. But I think the point that perhaps is the best way of illustrating what I'm saying and what I think you're getting at is at a certain point in the guidelines, the guidelines say that um, the obligation to be neutral or balanced should not, it does not mean that we have to be neutral on all issues, because in particular, we should not depart from an attachment to democratic values. Now, what those democratic values are, they'd get defined elsewhere in a part that I think has now been taken out of the, of, of the um, guidelines. But they, they talked about a representative government, um, independent courts and freedom of expression. Now, no one could argue that Israel has a voting system. They, they you know, quite recently have been voting almost on an annual basis. Um, and they certainly have independent courts. There were... Um, more or less, there were demonstrations in the courts in in in, in the streets for a year over uh, trying to defend that. Um, and um, freedom of information, free, free, freedom of expression was shown by those demonstrations as well as by anyone looking at the uh, Israeli press, which stretches from the far left to the far right. Uh, so Israel clearly exhib exhibits all of these qualities, and Hamas exhibits none of them. It, 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 it's clearly not representative. It clearly, I don't think it's got a, a court system at all that I'm aware of, certainly not independent of Hamas, um, and no freedom of expression. It comes very low down on any, any indices of that. So on the basis of the guidelines, the BBC ought, in my view, to interpret its own guidelines to say, well, we will exercise our lack of neutrality by saying, our default position is to believe Israel and to disbelieve Hamas. That should be, according to their guidelines, their default. They actually, I think, do exactly the opposite. Uh, where Hamas tells them something, they just recite it, parrot-like. Um, and where, where um, uh, Israel uh, states something, they uh, put words of doubt uh, all around it, you know, alleges, suggests, argues, uh, etc. But they create a, a fog of doubt over Israeli statements. Uh, it should be the other way around. Uh, and that's a, a further breach, which I believe runs throughout their broadcasting. In that context, may I ask you specifically about the casualty figures? Because we've had a lot of questions on that. What was your approach in the report to, to those? And I know there's cooperation with UKLFI on that front. Well, it, it, it's it, it's uh, a great pleasure to be able to give credit where the credit is due here. Um, I I was aware of the UKLFI very deep dive analysis into the uh, into the casualty figures, and um, UKLFI was kind enough to allow me to reproduce their the results of their work. 
And I satisfied myself almost exclusively by reproducing their work in relation to that analysis. But I did add a little bit of commentary from from myself, which I don't think uh, in any way um, uh, disagrees with, but merely just just probably echoes the points that UKFI has previously made, which is to say that the figures that are put out by the BBC are, I think, as close to dishonest as you can get. And that is to say, they know that the figures reported by Hamas are not true. They don't know what the true figures are, but they do know that those figures are not true. To give just one simple example, they include the 500 people that were not killed at al Ahli Hospital. Um, if there were 100 people that were killed, or 50, we don't know the exact number, then they do include that 100 people. They also include the other 400 people that didn't get killed. But they're all part of the casualty figures that are presented as though they've been killed by Israel. They know from independent studies by professors, which were analysed and looked at by by UKLFI, um, and I, which I've some of which I've I've read through, but not with the precision that they have. That the figures um, cannot be true statistically because on days when they want to change the numbers um, so that they can always keep the, the majority women and children, they just suddenly have 250 children die um, on, a, on a Tuesday, but no men or women in the same day, which normally there would be a, a relationship between the number of women and the number of children dying, but that relationship breaks down in the figures produced by Hamas. And then, of course, Hamas have subsequently started to allow anyone to email in uh, details of a death uh, and an analysis of those numbers again it's a uklfi analysis shows that some poor souls have had to die eight or nine times uh, which is tragic for them personally but you do, you know you only have to read the list to see that it's complete nonsense and it's therefore totally dishonest of the bbc to present that those numbers, and of course, not dividing between combatants and, 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 and civilians, and to make no comment as to the clear inaccuracy and, 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 and in places dishonesty of those numbers. And that they've, the BBC has made this a story of how many ca civilian casualties have there been? Can that be reasonable? That's their story for the whole year. And they've done it based upon false, knowably false, dishonest numbers. Trevor, we've, we're have we going to have to have you back because we've had so many questions on specifics that I desperately wanted to put to you. We're not going to have time for those. And my apologies uh, that there, there really has been an avalanche. Um, I want to leave as much time as possible to talk about where we go from here and what the remedies are. Um, but just before we do that, can you speak to what effect this report has had? Lots of people concerned. It might be going down the route of the Balin report. Obviously, it's had fantastic publicity. Um, it was followed by a separate report um, authored by Danny Cohen and Ruth Deitch. Um, So there's been a great deal of discussion about both. What have you seen the effect so far? Um, it has had more... Uh, a slightly more positive effect than the Balin report because the Balin report's not been read by anybody. And my report, uh, I say my report, I mean the report, which includes, of course, Haran Shani Narkis's work uh, and the data scientists and, and the legal team that I worked with, um, has, has been read and is being read. I think that it, I don't believe that um, it took nine months to put together um, of almost, you know, my only work during that period. Uh, I don't think that as thorough uh, an analysis of BBC output has been produced ever that, that I'm aware of. I mean, there may be, but I'm, I've never seen it. Um, so I think that its its impact has been quite widespread. I've had comments from all, all Jewish communities around the globe some of whom have reached out to me. I was uh, 
I spent an hour this morning talking to a, a group within a European country asking for assistance in running um, a similar analysis against their own broadcaster. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that that's, it's having that impact. I think it's drawn a line in the sand and in, it, it's thrown in a fairly solid piece of evidence that will last the, the, some time for anyone who wants to say, as people have said, you know, the last government that occasionally people would stand up in the House of Commons and say the BBC is biased. And the, the, the riposte would be, well, where's your evidence? Well, today, people have a solid answer to that. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it, it in the debate as to whether or not the BBC is really able to produce impar impartial news. I think this is a, a solid piece of, of, of argument that can be brought against them. It undermines their brand, it undermines their own claims. So it has a certain um, life uh, beyond that, but in the long run, it will get worn down over time if it if further, con further consequences do not follow from the report. And that's a a more complicated uh, uh, answer to a question you haven't asked. Well, I, I look forward to asking that just after addressing. Um, we have quite an international audience, so not many may uh, of of our uh, foreign friends may be aware that, of course, the BBC is financed through the license fee, which is mandatory for anyone that owns a television set, or in fact that watches um, BBC coverage via a computer. Um, so quite a few people have been venting their frustrations about having to pay the license fee, despite everything that you have said today, uh, and ask what uh, what the possible alternatives might be for that. Well, um, there, there is a long history of people not paying their license fee. As a an English solicitor with an obligations as an officer to the court, uh, I couldn't possibly recommend to anybody that they should disobey the law. Um, I I haven't looked into it, but I think it may be a criminal offence not to pay your license fee. Um, uh, and uh, one of the people that I've met in recent weeks, uh, around the time of the launch, told me with great joy how they in they have never paid the license fee and told me they've analysed uh, and that the BBC doesn't have the technology to detect who does not doesn't pay the licence fee and therefore uh, believes that they can get away with it. Um, My sense I is have... that the questioners were, were more um, after a, a point of principle. Is there any particular challenge open to them, given that they are required to fund the bias that you've set out? Until such time as there is a, an amend, an, an, a change in the law, I don't think that you have an alternative other than to obey the law and to pay the license fee. And that's where the mischief lies, because the BBC is watched by fewer and fewer people as, as a main news source, because news source comes from so many other places nowadays. And the only really good excuse for the BBC to exist as a public sector broadcaster, in my view, um, is that they are a source of impartial news where everyone else is able to produce their own bias. You wouldn't go to the Telegraph um, or the Guardian and expect not to find a somewhat left-leaning or somewhat right-leaning um, response, and you can't be you can't complain about that. Um, but if you go to the BBC, you expect to be getting the truth or close to the truth, uh, and of course. If they're completely unable to perform that prime function, one has to ask the question, are there any longer, is there any longer a reason for them to take four billion pounds from the uh, public uh, in order to be able to have the privilege of putting out their particular point of view on any subject? Because by the way, and, and this is a, a question I, I hope that I'll be able to give the answer to uh, if you ask me the right question. But I want to go into why this is happening. And, and essentially, if it is not cured or it's incurable, 
then what is the point of paying four billion pounds for a particular uh, opinion on any different issue? I'm quite sure if you were to do this analysis on the Russia-Ukraine war, on the the American elections, on whether or not um, independent schools should be um, uh, 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 tax free or, or or be charities, on any important topic that exists within. Um, the UK for discussion, the BBC is probably not giving you anything close to an impartial view. Why Uh, not? Well, why indeed? Um, May I wrap up uh, in the final few minutes uh, a number of questions, um, including where do we go from here? What are the remedies? Um, How can we deal with the situation that you have set out, given Uh, you're alluding to um, motivation, Um, whether JR uh, can in fact amount to anything, whether a court would in in fact be motivated to do anything meaningful on the back of a judicial review and connected to that, and apologies, I'm trying to get them all in. Are there any rules for correcting misleading information speedily? So could you perhaps deal with that as well as the, the you know the BBC complaints process we've covered previously in in webinars with Jonathan Turner, um, but are there any speedy mechanisms for correcting misleading information, and where do we go from here in terms of judicial review or other challenges? Okay, well I'm I'm going to start trying to answer that question by making one fundamental point that I haven't made yet, which I think is the most shocking finding of all. Uh, I was able to ask former and existing and present very senior, middling and junior um, people who have worked in the BBC. And they all told me the same thing, which is that there is no proper management control at all. So I know how many people were interviewed by the BBC who are Um, pro-Israeli and how many are pro-Palestinian. The BBC doesn't know that information because they don't monitor it. I know how many programmes they made which were moving left or right. The BBC doesn't know because it doesn't monitor that. They don't monitor what their journalists do or say. So they can't tell whether a journalist has disobeyed the rules or is obeying them scrupulously. And therefore they can't reprimand those journalists. And even the BBC itself has, when it's commissioned reports in the past, has noticed that there is essentially no proper management control. This is a vehicle, it's a four billion pound business, actually more, which has no proper management. That is the scandal, in my view, at the absolute foundation as to what's going wrong. If you don't have management control, then um, you cannot produce the kind of uh, product that you promise to produce. That 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 is at the foundation. So then where do you go from here? Well, there are various options. One of the options, which I, I, I fear some leaders of the Jewish community have put their faith in in the past and um, have always been disappointed, which is the fireside chat between um, the leaders of the BBC and the leaders of the Jewish community. And those fireside chats, I'm afraid, call me a cynic, but I have very little doubt that they can produce results. And one of the reasons they can't results uh, produce results is, as I think it was... Uh, I think it was FDR, one of the American presidents said, speak quietly, but carry a big stick. And when the leaders of the Jewish community go in to sit in the comfortable sofas uh, of the drawing room of Samir Shah or Tim Davey, they don't have a stick. They don't even have a small stick. Um, And therefore, the BBC, even if those senior people would like to affect change, They've got to move a mountain of journalists who are looking the other way and they won't be able to do it. They couldn't even get rid of um, uh, a football commentator, Gary Lineker, 
um, when he clearly broke broke BBC rules, absolutely clearly. Uh, uh, what they did was they changed the rules. Uh, so the the I think the fireside chats won't work um, if they're tried. And I also think, because I, I know that they've been initiated as a result of my report, there's been a petition in the House of Lords for an inquiry, and there's been comments that, that it needs to go before the Ministry of the, to the Committee of, of, of Media, Culture and Sport. It will possibly get onto that agenda. But I'm equally insured, assured by parliamentarians that those initiatives will um, disappear uh, into nothingness because there isn't a, a, a labor a labor majority that wants to push these ideas through so um the only power in the land which has the ability to effect some change is the courts and whether one can put together a case strong enough to demonstrate uh, that there is actually a, a judicially reviewable failure here, which I believe that there, there has been, um, then the courts could step in and um, if they could point to the management failure, which I think is absolutely at the core of this, um, then that is that is the a potential way forward. And, and e even down to the individual journalists, if an individual journalist is not being monitored and therefore not being told off um, for misbehaving, then they're going to carry on doing it. And in fact, they think they're doing a good job. I think that if a journalist is consistently unable to obey the rules, then they should be put somewhere less harmful, like Gardner's Question Time. And, you know, there they can carry on reporting, uh, but they don't need to report in an area that's important, controversial, where the rules uh, particularly uh, are particularly should be particularly strictly applied. Uh, in terms of whether there's a quick way, I'm afraid I don't know of one. Um, there isn't a quick fix here. It's a, it, you know, I think judicial review might be a fix, but I don't think there's anything else out there which could could cause a, a real change. Well, and Trevor, as you've identified, this is the um, getting to this point. Uh, of bias has been the work of, of several decades. Getting out of it may likewise require a substantial period of time, not least when um, the managers, uh, the editorial processes in place, have certainly been written about separately. Matty Friedman's excellent series of essays um, around 2014, I think he published them, rather suggest that the, the problems that you've identified have been baked in to the editorial processes, um, not just in the BBC, but in other media outlets for some time. This has been an absolute tour de force, as is the report. The praise from the chat and the Q&A is effusive. I'm tremendously grateful to Very you nice. for, for spending nine months of your life um, doing this important work and, and for talking about it as readily as you do. And I hope that you will have many more opportunities to do so. Trevor, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all the audience as well. Um, Good night. Good night. Good night.